everyone. Here is today's specimen. And I'll just move it around a little bit for you. And we're going to start off with our first polling question. So everyone should be able to see the polling question now. Go ahead and select your answer. Okay, so I'm going to end the polling questions there. And now we'll share the results. So as you guys can see, most people did get the question correct. And in fact, it is a right hemicolectomy specimen. So now we'll go through a little bit of the anatomy of the right hemicolectomy and what all is included with the right hemicolectomy specimen. So here is a diagram showing all the different types of colorectal resections that you can get. And the one highlighted in the orange square is that right hemicolectomy specimen. So it includes a portion of the terminal ilium, which is right here, going into the ileocecal valve right here. And then we have our cecum going into our ascending colon and then a little bit of our transverse colon. And I can tell that this is my transverse colon or a bit of it because I have my omentum attached to it here. So this fat looks a little bit different than this fat here. So this is the omental fat. I also have a appendix here, which comes off of the cecum. And so a few other uh, distinguishing factors that I know that I have a portion of large bowel primarily is that the large bowel has what's called tinea coli. So that's three bands of longitudinal smooth muscle. And you can see that right here. And that's kind of where I made my cut through the specimen. It also has plastra. So it's these kind of like pouches it's a little hard to tell with this one because it's been formal and fixed, kind of flattened. There are little pouches that have formed. You can see a little bit here. And then as well, epiploic appendages, which are these fatty appendages that are covered in peritoneum. And those are all just for the large bowel. So it, that's how we distinguish between the large bowel versus the small bowel. Another important aspect of anatomy to discuss with a right hemicolectomy specimen or any type of specimen is the artery and blood supplies. So that will lead us into our next polling question. And I'm going to end the polling question there. So here are the results for that polling question. Most people got it right. It is, in fact, iliocolic, right colic, and middle colic. The inferior mesenteric and right colic are not correct because, in fact, the three vessels come off of the SMA. And that's depicted in this diagram here. So you can see the SMA, and then you can see those three branches coming off. So the iliocolic, the right colic, and the middle colic, which are all supplying that right side of the colon. The middle colic is also the one that is supplying the transverse colon. So it kind of has collaterals that go both to the right colon and then also to the transverse colon. Another important aspect to discuss about the anatomy of the bowel is the different layers of the bowel. And this is going to come into really high importance when we're talking about staging later on. So it's important to understand these different layers of the bowel. So going outside in, it starts with first the serosa, which you can see with the red arrow 
and that red line on the actual bowel specimen. And then it goes the subserosa, then muscularis propria, which is seen with the green arrow there. And then after the muscularis propria, then we have the submucosa, which is seen with the blue arrow. And then we have our muscularis mucosa, and then our mucosa as the most inner layer. And that's seen with the yellow arrow there. So now we'll just go through how to open these types of specimens, how we open them and why we open them. So we open specimens to allow for the formalin to enter the specimen so that it can fix properly and that the tissue doesn't die and become necrotic on the inside. So for colon cases, we want to hinge the staple lines, which will be at the end resection margins. So here's my staple line here that I've hinged. And then here's my staple line here that I've hinged. Then I want to cut through my pinea coli, which I showed you a little bit earlier, this muscle band here. I always want to avoid cutting through the side that has all of the fat on it because that's where my radial margin will be. And we'll discuss that a little bit later. And if I'm cutting through my serosa and I feel that the mass is right where I'm going to have to cut, I want to put some ink over top of that before I cut through, just so that when I'm grossing the specimen, it's easy to identify where the actual serosa is versus where I made that cut. As you can imagine, like you can see here, it's kind of a little bit distorted now that I've cut through and the mucosa has kind of come over a bit. So it can be difficult to identify the true serosa grossly. So as some of you may have guessed, this specimen is out for colon cancer. So this is the cancer right here, right in the cecum. So we'll go through a little brief overview of colon cancer. So adenocarcinoma of the colon is the most common malignancy of the gastrointestinal tract. It's the second most common cause of cancer death. The incidence usually peaks around 60 to 70 years of age. And there's a higher incidence observed in Western type food diets because of the high calorie foods, rich in animal fats, combined with a sedentary lifestyle. Other risk factors also include meat consumption, smoking, and alcohol consumption. There's also a few other genetic components that also affect and lead to a risk factor. So that will lead us into our next polling question. Which gene is not associated with an increased risk of colorectal cancer? Okay, so I'm going to end the polling question there and then share the results with you. So it does look like most people did get it correct. So the correct answer is D and it is men one is not associated with increased risk of colorectal cancer. So MLH1 is associated with that's Lynch syndrome. APC is familial adenomatous polyposis. And then STK11 is poots jagger syndrome. So all of those are polyposis syndromes. So they're all going to be leading to an increased risk of colorectal cancer. MEN1 um, is the three Ps. So that one is pituitary adenoma, parathyroid, hyperplasia, and pancreatic tumors. All right, we're actually going to go straight into our next polling question now. Okay, so how do patients with right-sided carcinoma typically present? Okay, so I'm going to end the polling there and then share the results. So uh, there's actually a quite kind of like even split throughout most of the 
answers here. So the correct answer is actually anemia. And we'll go through kind of the differences between the two on the next slide here. So right-sided cancers clinically present usually with fatigue and weakness due to iron deficiency anemia. They often grow in a polyploid configuration or exophytic appearance and extend along one wall of the cecum or ascending colon. And then these tumors rarely cause obstruction versus these left-sided ones. Those ones are the ones that are presenting with more of that occult bleeding, changes with the bowel habits, cramping in the left lower quadrant discomfort. And they usually present in like more of an annular or circumferential mass. So you can see here with our specimen, so we have a right-sided cancer and it's showing the typical kind of right-sided cancer appearance with this polyploid exophytic looking mass. So not all right hemicolectomies for malignancy are out for adenocarcinoma. There are a few other types of malignancies that you should be thinking of when you get a colon type of cancer case. So we'll go through a few of those different gross features so that you guys are aware of those different features. So our first one here is actually a typical presentation of an adenocarcinoma, just so that you can see another example of that one. So you can see the polypoid appearance. And then also the cut surface is really um, like tan and white. And that's the typical kind of appearance that you would see with a cut surface of an adenocarcinoma. So here's our next one. And I'm actually going to bring up another polling question for this one as well. So you guys shall be able to see the question now and I'll give you a few seconds to answer. Uh, okay, so I'm going to end the polling there and then share the results with you. So it looks like most people pick GIST. That's not the correct answer. The correct answer is actually a neuroendocrine tumor. And what gives it away is really that yellow appearance of this mass. Usually neuroendocrine tumors typically present with more of like this very yellow kind of appearance. A GIST also is extremely rare in the colon and the most common site for it in the colon is actually the rectum. And rectal GISTs make up approximately 5% of all GISTs. So we'll go to our next picture here. So this one is a leiomyosarcoma that I actually grossed earlier this year. And you can see with the cut surface of it, it's very like white, kind of pink, fleshy in appearance, a lot different than those other two that we just saw. So when you have a cut surface like this, you want to be thinking, oh, maybe this could be a leiomyosarcoma. And then here's our last gross feature picture. So this one is a lymphoma and it's arising right at the ileocecal valve. So you can see the ileocecal valve kind of over on that right hand side right there. And then you can see that white um, homogenous mass that's um, beginning to grow right at that intersection there. So now we're going to go through the grossing steps. So no matter what type of cancer your specimen is out for, most of the grossing steps will be the exact same. So we're still going to be wanting to do all of the measurements, distances to margins, all of the basic things that we would do for any sort of like cancer case. So now let's go through the steps. So to identify what the specimen is. So we already did that. It's a right hemicolectomy specimen. Then our next step would be our main findings, our additional findings, ink code, and section code. So we'll go through each one of those categories to really break it down. So our specimen, we said a right hemicolectomy specimen. So that will include our terminal ileum, which we see here, our appendix, which we pointed out earlier, our colon, which is along here, and then our pericolic soft tissue, and then for this one, we also have omentum here. So 
So for the portions of bowel, we'll want to give a measurement in length and then also as open circumference for each part of those. For the appendix, we'll give a total length and then a measurement of diameter. And then for the pericolic soft tissue and the omentum, we'll give one measurement that's the greatest depth. So to get greatest depth, we'll measure from where it's um, inserting onto the bowel and uh, where the surgeon basically had to resect. So about there. And then for the omentum, that much there. So our next part is main findings. So our main findings for this is going to be the tumor. So we'll want to talk about the tumor size. So give its measurements, three dimensions, configurations. So this one is like tan and exophytic. Depth of invasion, which is going to be really important in staging that we'll touch on a little bit later. And if it extends into any other organs or structures. So for this one, because it's so close to the appendix and the appendiceal orifice, we're going to be wanting to take some sections showing the appendiceal orifice in relationship to that mass, just to make sure that the mass isn't extending into the appendix. We'll also be wanting to give distances to end resection margins. So we'll give a distance to our proximal resection margin here, and then distance to our distal end resection margin. As well, we'll talk about the relationship with serosa, which is overlying here. And then also the distance to the radial margin. So now we're going to spend a little bit of time discussing the different types of radial margins that you get with bowel specimens, because I know that can be a point of confusion for some early learners. So first, when discussing radial margins, it's really important to understand exactly what parts of colon have which and which ones are intraperitoneal versus retroperitoneal. So the ascending colon and descending colon are both retroperitoneal organs. So they sit right on the back of the posterior abdominal wall. So when the surgeon removes those, they kind of like peel them right off that back layer. And then for the transverse and sigmoid colon, those ones are intraperitoneal and those ones have mesentery attached to them. So the surgeon has to cut through that mesentery so you get a vascular tie resection margin. So here's another picture just really depicting that. So letter A is showing in at the ascending colon, which would be the same as like the descending colon where you have that serose lie surface on the one side, and then that whole area on the other side where the arrows are pointing, that would be the radial margin. And that's where the surgeon had to peel the bowel off of the um, posterior abdominal wall. So for part B, that would be an example of the sigmoid colon or the transverse colon, where you have that mesentery stump there. And then the surgeon would transect through that fat, and then you would get a vascular tie margin. And then for C, that's the lower one third of the rectum, where you don't have any serosa anymore. So you get a circumferential radial margin. So the entire outside of that specimen is the radial margin. So for our specimen, because we have an ascending colon, our radial margin will be kind of that full, like, area versus the vascular tie margin. So we want to kind of look through here. And an easy way to kind of identify it is looking first for the side that's obviously serosalized. So you can see this side here, it's very like shiny and smooth. And then this side is a bit more dull. So this here is our radial margin. That's all right here. And then you kind of want to piece it back together to identify where the other side is, usually there's kind of like a little like flap almost. So this side is serosa again. And then this side is again, like that more dull side. So I would be inking kind of right through here. And then when I get more into my transverse colon, we can actually see the vascular tie margins. So you can see here, this vessel here, and it's kind of this rough area along here. That would be my 
vascular tie margin for if I had a cancer that was closer to my transverse colon here. So now we're going to go into our additional findings. So we've talked about what the specimen is, the main finding is, which is this mass here. And then we'll want to talk about the background mucosa. So identifying if there's any other polyps at all. And then if there is polyps, we'll want to give their size range location. So I circled the polyps on that picture in the PowerPoint slide there. So we'll measure those to both the end resection margins, and as well to the mass. And um, we'll also want to be commenting on if there is a tattoo. So that's shown in, with the red arrow there. And the tattoo is placed by the surgeon before the surgery. And it's just either at the site usually of the tumor or right below the site of the tumor, just so that they know that they got the tumor out when they're doing the surgery. And we'll also want to be commenting about all of the lymph nodes that we found. So we'll say how many there are that we found and then also their size range. So I'm going to bring up our next polling question. So how many lymph nodes should you find in a colorectal cancer case? Okay, so I'm going to stop the polling there and share the results. So mostly everyone got it correct. It is in fact all of them. So we want to find all of the lymph nodes that we can. This is really important for patient staging and then also for patient treatment. So even if you do find the very minimum 12, and none of them are positive, the patient still might go and get chemo. So that's why it's really important that we find as many as possible. You can also get really small lymph nodes that have small metastatic deposits and that will upstage the patient. So this lymph node hunt is very important even though it is time consuming. Our next steps, making sure to comment on how we ink the specimen. So inking, so we'll do black for the radial margin and then blue for the serosa. And that's just at our institution. It could be different at other people's institutions. So you can see here in the picture that the blue is overlying the mass there. That's the blue ink that we put on before we cut through that specimen. Because this mass here is a circumferential mass. So we wanted to ink it before we cut through to open it. And then for this one, for my radial margin, again, I would kind of ink this whole area here, which I stated earlier. So now we'll go through sectioning. So for end resection margins, so we'll either want to be submitting those on fast or perpendicular, and it depends on where the tumor is located. So if the tumor is located less than two centimeters from that end resection margin, we're going to be wanting to do perpendicular sections in relationship to the margin. If the mass like this one is very far from those end resection margins and we're not going to get it in the same section, then we'll be doing on fast sections of the whole proximal and distal margins. For this one, because it includes the appendix, we'll also want to be doing representative sections of the appendix. If we do find anything abnormal in the appendix, then we're going to be wanting to submit more sections, obviously. And then we'll want to be doing sections of the mass. So we'll do deepest point of invasion, relationship to other organs, mass with adjacent uninvolved. So for this one, I usually like to do a section showing mass with adjacent uninvolved proximal mucosa, and then also another section with the distal uninvolved mucosa. Closest serosa. And this one we'll want to be taking um, quite a few sections of if the, if the mass is very close to the serosa and it's hard to tell grossly if there's involvement of the serosa or not, because that will upstage the patient. So it will be important to take a lot of those sections so that uh, it can be identified underneath the microscope. We'll also be wanting to take the closest radial margin. 
So if the mass is super close to the radial margin, then we can take the mass with the radial margin. But in this case, it's not very close. So we probably will just have to take a representative kind of, of the radial margin. We'll also be wanting to submit our additional findings. So that would be like our pull-ups, the tattoo site if we found that. And then we'll be submitting all of the lymph nodes that we found. So here is just a sample grossing template that we use at our institution. The specimen includes the total, all the measurements that we've kind of already went over. If there's any sort of like perforation or defect, what the inking method is, and then all of the information needed for the tumor and then the additional findings, and then our section code as well. So this is just like a nice organized way to keep track of everything that you need to be submitting and all the measurements and all the things that you need to be talking about for a right hemiglectomy for cancer. Um, so now we're going to go into the staging. So we'll bring up our next polling question. So you guys shall be able to see the polling question there. Okay, um, so I'm going to stop the polling there. So it looks like most people picked B, which is correct, but C was a close second. So we'll go through exactly and explain these differences in the staging. So for T1, that's when the tumor invades into the submucosa. T2 is when the tumor invades into the muscularis propria. Um, T3 is when the tumor invades into the pericolic soft tissue. And then T4A is when it invades into the visceral peritoneum. So that was the correct answer for the polling question. And then T4B, where it kind of confused people, um, was that it is invades or adheres to adjacent organs or structures. Both of those are classified as T4B. So now talking about the regional lymph nodes, the end stage, it just depends on how many lymph nodes are positive. So N1A is one lymph node positive, N1B is two to three lymph nodes are positive. And it's important to note that N1C has no regional nodes positive, but there is a tumor deposit. So if there's any tumor deposits, that's going to automatically upstage the patient. And then going down, then you get the four more, six, and then seven or more, which would be the last one there, the 2B. So now talking about distant metastasis. So this is not usually required in the pathological report. Um, it's only required if it's confirmed pathologically for the case. So I'll bring up my next polling question. So what is the most common location for metastatic colorectal cancer? I'm going to stop the poll there and share the results. So yes, the correct answer is liver. So liver is the most common site for metastatic lesions because of the portal drainage system. Other common locations include the peritoneum, lungs, and bone. So now we'll just go to our last slide here, talking about the prognostic factors for colon cancer. So the two most important prognostic factors are the depth of invasion and the presence or absence of lymph node metastasis. So in this picture here, you can see that the depth of invasion, the cancer is going into the pericolic soft tissue, so that would be a T3. I'll bring up our last polling question of the event. So which of the following is not a poor prognostic factor for colorectal cancer?
So I'm going to end the polling there and share the results with everyone. So the correct answer is C. Tumor over 10 centimeters in size is the correct answer. So that one does not lead to a poor prognostic factor. Tumor perforation does because that can seed tumor seeds throughout the whole abdominal cavity. And then signet ring cell carcinoma is a histological type of colorectal cancer that does lead to a poor prognostic. And then tumor budding, that's the presence of a single tumor cell or a small cluster of up to five cells at the advancing front of the tumor. And this one has been shown to lead to an increased risk of nodal involvement. So that is all for the presentation. Thank you all for attending and I hope to see you again next month.